How do we make better environmental decisions? Where do we find the answers to climate change and energy dependence, the California drought, and all the other major environmental challenges we're going to face in the 21st century? I am a neuroeconomist. Uh, I study the mind, and so naturally enough, I turn to the brain for those answers. Now, neuroeconomics uh, combines behavioral economics and brain imaging to tackle big questions like how do we allocate scarce resources? Uh, how do we make trade offs between moral and economic values or between uh, long term benefits and short term gains? All of this is readily applicable uh, to the environmental decisions. That we face today. But historically, neuroeconomists have mostly focused in the financial domain and left、uh, environmental problems open.、Uh, nowadays, we're studying them in, at Stanford, and that's what we're going to be talking about、uh, today what we gain from an environmental perspective from getting a window into the mind. Now, when we're studying environmental decision making, ideally, We'd like to first look at a macro scale, so at the population level,、uh, and we can get at this with national surveys and market data and that sort of thing. But we'd also like a very micro scale, a view of mechanistically what's going on in the brain、uh, as people make decisions that have real environmental consequences. To do this, we use fMRI,、uh, which you can think of as time lapse photography. Of、uh, the brain's activity. And we do this on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise here.、Um, <laughs> somebody lies down in the tube on the left and they interact with a computer program、uh, that we've programmed and they give us answers and we scan their brain while they're doing it. And what we get out the other end, you've probably seen this kind of thing before. It looks rather like a heat map. And what we're actually looking at is called the bold response. Or how the brain shuttles around blood and oxygen in order to meet the demands of brain activity. What can we get out of this? Well, there's a few different things where we can analyze this data.、Uh, one is what brain mechanisms are responding when people are parsing, when they're processing the information that we're providing to them, right? And how do different types of people process that information differently? The second thing we can do is really exciting. And that is behavioral prediction. In the parts of the brain that we're interested in, which activity actually predicts not just individual level behavior,、uh, but even population level behavior? Just in the last few years, there have been a number of successes with、uh, small neural focus groups successfully、uh, predicting behavioral,、uh, population level behavior in everything from、uh, music sales to the efficacy of anti smoking ad campaigns. And the important point here is that it's done so better、uh, than the self report, the conscious ratings that the people in those studies were providing.、Uh, now, how can this be? You can imagine,、uh, for example, with a music study, that maybe you're listening to a Miley Cyrus single and the chorus is a little catchy, and that activates the reward pathway, which we're going to talk about a little bit later.、Uh, but someone asks you to actually give you, them a rating of how much you like that song, and you're never ever going to let, let that get out there. So, Um, you know, that's not your bag, that's not what you're about. And so the rating that you give is very, very different. But that little part of your brain、uh, activity there is much more representative of the general population level response、uh, when that song goes on the radio.、Uh, so those are the kind of differences that we can talk about and the differences that we gain、uh, something from looking at brain imaging versus just self report and what people are telling us. Now let's talk about. Environmental decision making for a minute. I want you to take a second and just look at that photograph and think about how much you'd be willing to pay for an average size print of it to hang up in your house. We all have a certain intuition for what that number would be. Now, let me ask you a different question. How much would you pay to protect the space, the physical, natural place?、Uh, how much would you pay to ensure its continued existence? Now, many of you may be thinking that's not really a fair question, or it's even a morally reprehensible question, right?、Uh, we have a good intuition for how much we pay for a cup of coffee or a TV or a print of a photograph of a place, but very little for natural resources or public goods in general. We just don't know how to put a dollar value on that. 
And so, like any good human being, what we end up doing is falling back on our emotions. Uh, and herein lies the problem for environmental economists. Because for litigation and policy-making purposes, they do need to get at that intrinsic value of what things are worth. When a tanker founders and ruins a pristine natural bay, you want to get some assessment, not just of the economic loss from all the fisheries that were compromised, but also what it means to people, quality of life, the value that they place on that place being there and being pristine and having a vibrant ecosystem inside of it, right? Uh, and so they try to survey people to figure this out. And the problem is that in many of these sur surveys, a third to half of the respondents say, you can't put a price on that, it's invaluable. Or they name a dollar amount that's larger than what they have in their bank account. So it becomes unusable. We get another example of where self-report is not really uh, beneficial for defining value. And maybe we need to look within the brain to do this. So that's what we did. Uh, we put people in an MRI machine, and we asked them to make choices about um, protecting threatened natural spaces from new developmental land uses that had varying levels of destructiveness. And so we'd show them a place, uh, and then a land use for that place, like mining, uh, and then an amount that they could donate. And we did this in 72 different scenarios, and one of those trials was chosen to count for real. And any donation that they made on that trial, if they decided, then uh, we would actually implement that. We would give it to their choice of the California State Parks or the National Parks Foundation. Uh, so they were making real decisions. And these people, for the most part, participated in these studies to make money for themselves. And so there's no real incentive for them to donate. But uh, over 58% of the time, people actually did uh, donate to these places to preserve them. So what was going on in their heads when they were doing this? First, when they were seeing the, the place, uh, if they found that place to be more iconic and archetypal, uh, that activated the reward pathway in the brain. Now, we call this the reward pathway uh, because it's related to uh, you know, good food, even better wine, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. All the good stuff that we like in life tends to activate the system. It's associated with positive emotions and approach behavior, things that we desire, that we want to go and, and check out and approach. And as a result, it tends to be very predictive of behavior in uh, financial decision-making, everything from when you're buying stuff to uh, gambling decisions, that sort of thing. So these epic landscapes were inspiring this pathway as well. Now, what about the land uses, right? Uh, when they saw more destructive land uses, it activated a part of the brain called the anterior insula. And this is, re responds broadly to aversive stimuli, so things that we find physiologically or even morally disgusting, um, the pain of others, everything that we would want to avoid generally uh, tends to activate the anterior insula. And interestingly, this activation predicted people's donation to put money on the line and actually defend these parks. Moreover, we got more activation in the anterior insula, significantly more, when people had stronger environmental concern, when they were more pro-environmental individuals. Now, this is an important point, because what it means is we can visibly see differences between people when they care more about the environment in their brain and what's going on, uh, and see that also reflected in their behavior, how they put money on the line. And if we can do that in this kind of paradigm, we can do this in other experiments as well, uh, and with other individual differences than just are they more or less pro-environmental. Now, in contrast to those emotional responses that were driving donation, uh, we had activation in a more rational, reflective part of the brain that was integrating all of the information from these choices. And this was called the medial prefrontal cortex, and it does a whole host of things, uh, but it's involved in how you do cost-benefit analysis and figure out the subjective value of what something is worth to you. And Activation here actually predicted the selfish option, withholding money for yourself, okay? So, in summary, we had this tension between the emotional processes and these more rational and reflective processes uh, t playing a tug of war for whether or not you donated to help the environment. Now, what does this mean for nonprofits and environmental me messaging and the like? For years, uh, we've been saying in the environmental community, if we just give people more uh, information, more statistics, better data, they'll come around, right? 
and they'll start making better environmental decisions. But that leverages the rational and reflective parts of the brain, and maybe we're not creating the most compelling case. Maybe approaching it through an emotional lens is the way to get people to act outside of themselves and for a more common, greater good. People often ask me how I got into this environmental niche, and uh, it actually was a very emotionally motivated story as well. So uh, I have a brittle bone disability. I broke half a dozen bones a couple weeks ago. That's why I'm not giving you the Aaron Sorkin walk and talk right now. And uh, this had a couple of good positive effects when I was growing up. And uh, one of them was because I was stuck in the house so much, I became a voracious reader and in time a writer of my own stories. And the other was that being out in nature became a really big deal for me. So it became a sign of good health uh, and something to aspire to, as it is for many, many people. Right? And so those, that nature writing, writing turns into nature stories. I eventually published a, a novel on wolves when I was in high school. And then when I was in undergrad, uh, I followed biology. And because I couldn't do ecological field work, I turned toward neuroscience. I worked on trying to mitigate damage from stroke and worked in the medical field for a number of years. But the longer I was in biotech, the more I felt like I was being pulled further and further afield from what got me interested in uh, biology in the first place. But I, at first, I couldn't chart a course back from my love of neuroscience and my love of nature and put the two together. Until late one night in, in 2009, I was reading neuroeconomics papers for fun, as one does. <laughs> and uh, I, I started noticing the stuff that we started to talk with. with you know, it's all about trading off uh, present and future values and allocating scarce resources. And I thought, this is really cool. I wonder if anybody's done this uh, with respect to environmental decision making. And this was 2009, and I looked around, and no one really had. And now we're in 2015, and still no one's really looking at this. And so why is that? You can imagine it's really, really complex, right? All of the different motivations that drive us to behave pro-environmentally and the different pro-environmental behaviors that you and I and the person two seats next to you engage in, those are all very diverse. How do you deal with that diversity of thought? Because nobody really checks all the boxes up there, right? We all have our pet projects that we do, even if we're very pro-environmental in our attitudes. Uh, the trick to looking at this is basically paying attention to these individual differences. If we measure them, we factor them into our analyses, we can figure out which differences matter. Uh, and we can even then look at how those differences are represented in the brain. So for instance, right now, we're looking at uh, how people make decisions around energy efficient purchases, uh, how they react to eco-labels like the Energy Star when they're buying a fridge or a light bulb. And we find big differences in how people process that data, process energy consumption data and the labels and all of that, uh, when they're, for instance, better at math, right? And there's differences in how their brain, what parts of their brain they use, how active those parts are, and how that affects the decision making on the back end. So neuroscience really gives us this lens into the decision making process. And it's high time that we use this for you know, good and lofty goals, like not only helping people save the planet, but helping them save uh, money on their electricity bill at the same time, right? Um, this is very, you know, pioneering work. People aren't really combining this stuff together. So I've been very lucky uh, at Stanford that I've had the freedom, uh, thanks to a number of different groups, uh, to combine neuroscience uh, and environmental science. I, I really believe that um, for solving all these big, 21st century uh, environmental problems, we're going to need to find these different interdisciplinary crossroads where we can study decision making from a number of different angles, look at the individual and the population level, and, and weave some kind of a structured story out of that and, and get some insights into how people are making decisions. The cost of not doing so is very, very high indeed, and that's why it's necessary. So thank you. <laughs>